Revelation chapter 12, starting with verse 1. Look at Revelation chapter 12, starting with verse 1. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars under her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven. An enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, seven crowns on his head. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flew them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth, so he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. <coughs> her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Then I saw a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come for sal the salvation, the power, and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before our God, day and night, has been hurled down. They have overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their life so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you will dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he has known that his time is short. When the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle, so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert, where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and half a times out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away from her, uh, with the torrent. The earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. The dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obeyed the commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, we come and ask that we come with respect that it deserves. We pray that we would honor you by seeing what it says and living it. So please give me the words of wisdom to explain it correctly. And please strengthen us in all things. Please give us eyes to see, ears to hear, a mind to understand, and a heart to perceive. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We praise in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. What we're looking at here from the book of Revelation is a kind of a strange teaching, if you will. It's one, as we look at it, we, we may not fully understand. What I think we're looking at here is to understand the rebellion, the defeat, and the Satan. See, as we go into the, to the scriptures, we read a lot about Satan, or the devil as he may be called. And we know that he has fallen from God. But there's a lot about the fall of Satan that we do not understand. It's a mystery to us. There's a lot that God maybe hasn't revealed to us. He's just revealed enough to us so that we know and understand that A, Satan is evil. B, he is coming to harm the church. And C, he is trying to lead people in his rebellion. But this passage in Revelation, I believe, gives us clear insights into something about the fall of Satan. It gives us some, some teachings that we need to go back and review and so that we understand. And I think it's important during this time of year because as we're starting to look at a lot of things, a lot of uh, things that deal with Halloween and people talk about ghosts and demons and stuff like that, I think it's important to go back and examine quite clearly who Satan really is, because to me people think of him as that little cartoon that they see. You know, that, that little red man running around with a pitchfork with a little tail and, you know, talking in people's ears? <clears throat> no. Satan here is described as an enormous dragon who's wanting to devour. He's called that ancient serpent from long ago. Today I want us to take a look at this this 
teaching that we see here. And I wanted to, to kind of guide us through what we do know about Satan's fall and Satan's rebellion. Satan is leading a rebellion against God, and those who follow him are going to meet his fate. Let's begin now at the root cause of Satan's sin. What was at the root of it? And if you go into 1 Timothy chapter 3, start with verse 1, we see something that Paul says, and a lot of times we skip over this because the context of this passage is about church leadership, and specifically here, the eldership. But when we start to look at this passage, Paul makes a note that we shouldn't just gloss over. So as we're reading this, pay close attention to what Paul actually says here. He says, here's a trustworthy saying, if anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of both one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkardness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert or may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Again, you know, I think it's really important when we read it, a lot of times, and we'll take a step back about reading the scripture. A lot of times when we read, if we're reading really fast just to get that one chapter out of our way for the day, sometimes we miss the little things, the little key details that's in the scripture. That's why it's more important if you don't get through a whole chapter then it's not a big deal. Go through it and really pay attention to what we're saying here. First of all, I want to say this. There's more to sin than just an action. I want us to really understand this. There is a motive behind it. There's a reason behind it. There is a desire behind it. There is something that motivates us to do that action. Now, we can eliminate the action, but if we don't eliminate the desire, it's just going to pop up somewhere else. You have to go to wherever the root cause of that sin is and cut it off there, which is why when Jesus was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount and in other passages where if your eye causes you to sin, God's death, he's not really being literal here as to do harm to our bodies. What he's talking about is, is go right to the root of the problem and eliminate the root and you eliminate the action. Behind Satan's sin was conceit or pride. This is the warning yet here. Whatever Satan originally did, he did it to fulfill his conceit of pride, which is often at a lot of our sin. In fact, I would say this. Many speculate, this is a speculation based off of what some inferences are, a certain passage of the Bible. I chose not to use here because it wasn't doesn't directly name Satan, but many people infer that. If you have questions on that, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about it after the service. But many people think that what Satan's original sin was, was that he wanted to be like God. That he wanted that, that position, that power. He wanted that worship. And really, when you look at Satan, what he desires is for people to worship him on this earth. There is a conceit of pride behind it. So whatever he originally did, probably pride was right behind it, it seems like. It seems like that it, it got to him. And if this conceit, if we take this, this passage here from 1 Timothy to give us a little hint into the origin of Satan, this conceit behind him caused him to go and sin. Now I would you say, in, in, in lieu of that, if you really want to think about sin, sin is actually telling God, I want to knock you off your throne. You told me not to do something, but I don't want you as my king. I don't want to be king. And I'm going to do what I want to do regardless of what you feel or what you say. Sin at its root is a pride that is knocking God off his throne. And Satan often uses pride to entice us to sin. Let's go back to the original book of Genesis, the original sin. Now, if, if we combine this with the first Timothy passage, I think we can see maybe a little bit behind Satan's sin because it's what he uses to entice Eve. 
And usually when we want to entice people, we use what would appeal to us. So what did he say? Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat fruit from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from, it, from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Okay, let's pause here for a second. Did you notice what he said to her? You will be like God. This is what he's going to use to entice Eve. Notice her reaction. When a woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and I also desirable for gaining wisdom. So that desire to be like God, to have that knowledge, to have your eyes open, that's what got to her. The desire to do that. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were open, they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. <coughs> in this passage, we kind of see that where Satan gets Eve, and eventually Adam, is with that pride, that conceit, to be like God. And by the way, I think this is man's problem today. We're doing everything that we can to try to eliminate God from our lives, but you can't do that. We tend to think that modern medicine will cure all diseases, but death still exists. We think that we can control or change the weather, but God's still in control of that. We think that our science can explain everything, but there's so much about the universe. We still there's so much about the human body. Forget the universe for a second. The human body we still don't understand. Conceit and pride tries to push God out of our lives by elevating ourselves up to Godhood. This is why we need to control our pride. Look, there's several things we should be proud of. There's several things we should take pride in. But when our pride gets out of hand, when our pride gets out of control, that is when sin takes root. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 16, start with verse 18. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride has been at the root of a lot of good people's fall. And I would even dare say, as we look at the problems that we deal with in our society and our country today, that pride is often at the root of that, too. America has become so prideful in our wealth, so prideful in our military might, so prideful in our accomplishments that we have neglected God more and more. We have more than anyone else in the world to give God credit for, and we're pushing Him more and more out of our lives. Pride is destructive. So what, was, what happened to Satan? I mean, his pride got in the way, his conceit got in the way. What happened to him and what we're going to look at is the fact that Satan lost his place. Luke chapter 10, starting with verse 18. Luke chapter 10, starting with verse 18. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I believe what Jesus is referring to is what we read just a little earlier in Revelation. He talks about Satan falling like lightning. I believe he's referring to Satan being cast out of heaven after he lost his war with the archangel Michael. Just think about this for a second. We're going to talk about Satan's limits. I want you to understand, while Satan is powerful, he's not all powerful. While he is powerful, he is not all-powerful. He is not God's equal. In fact, he couldn't even be God's archangel, Michael. That's like, uh, you know, if, if we have a, a basketball team this year, and, and, and we have a JV team and a varsity team, this team comes in, and they want to brag about it, they can't even beat our freshman or JV team, and they think they're going to beat our varsity? Come on. 
God, oh, excuse me, Satan couldn't even defeat God's JV team. He couldn't defeat Michael. How much more so could he not defeat God? How much is he going to be limited by God? In fact, when you go into the book of Job, one of the most important lessons out of the book of Job in chapter 1 is the fact of how God still controls. Satan cannot ultimately do whatever he wants. God puts limitations. He has Satan on a leash. We see this very clearly in Job chapter 1, starting with verse 6. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came <coughs> with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Notice this. God has the ability to question and judge Satan. Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. And the Lord said to Satan, if you consider my servant Job, there is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. So notice this. As we go into this, I want to talk about one of the limits of Satan for a second. Satan's roaming the earth, but God's the one that picks his champion. God's the one that knows which one can stand up to Satan. Satan doesn't know this. He doesn't know truly what Job is capable of doing. There's information that God has that Satan doesn't have. Satan has to come up here before God. God does not appear before Satan. God has information. Satan doesn't. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands, so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has is in your hands. But the man himself did not lay a finger. I want you to notice something. Oh, then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Notice something here that's very key. Before Satan goes to tax Job, God basically puts down the perimeters. This is how far you're allowed to go, Satan. When you go into Jesus' night that he was betrayed, the night he had installed the Lord's Supper, he does something very similar. Satan said, or Jesus said, Satan asked for permission to sift Peter like wheat. Do you notice that? Satan couldn't just go do what he wanted to, he had to ask permission. See, Satan is bound. He is not all powerful. He has a limit. And when you go back into this, there's some things we can lose with this, or look, see with this. First of all, Satan lost his war with Michael and lost his place in heaven. There's a lot of speculation about what place Satan had in heaven, and I want to leave it just there as speculation. Uh, the scripture doesn't go into great detail about his placement or about where he was. In fact, we don't have a lot about the placement of the angels in heaven. We get a few names of a few angels. We get Michael and Gabriel, and Michael's <coughs> probably the one we have the most information on, but about Satan's actual place we don't know. Here's what we do know. When they had that war in heaven, and Satan lost, <coughs> Satan also lost whatever place he had in heaven. Whatever position, whatever place of, of duty he had, was taken from him. He lost it all. And he was cast out. Our rebellion could cause us to lose our position in this world. As we look at the things that we try to do and try to accomplish, even things that we try to do for God, whether it be things in the church or, or things just in his kingdom as a whole, Understand this, that our pride, if it gets in the way, can cause us to have a hard fall. In the Old Testament, there's probably no better example of this than a guy named Saul. His account is in 1 Samuel. We're going to look at specifically at 15 through, uh, chapter 15, look at 10 through 29. Saul was the first king of Israel. And he actually started off a fairly good guy. And then his pride got in the way a couple different times. First time was when he tried to offer sacrifices, which a king couldn't do. Second time is when he just disobeyed God. We see this starting with verse 10. The word of the Lord came to Samuel. I'm grieved that I made Saul king, 
because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was troubled and cried out to the Lord all that night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone down to Gilgal. But Samuel reached him. Saul said, The Lord bless you. I've carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowering of the cattle I hear? Saul answered, The soldiers brought them back, brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle and sacrificed to the Lord your God. We told him to destroy the rest. Stop! Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, Although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And he sent you out on a mission saying, Go and completely destroy those wicked Amalekites. People, the Amalekites, make war on them until you wipe them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pass on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, the king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder. The best of what was devoted to God. In order to sacrifice them to the Lord, your God, at Gilgal. Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of the rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. And Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, I have violated the Lord's command. In your instructions, I was afraid of the people, and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive me my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe, and it tore. Samuel said to him, The Lord has come toward the kingdom of Israel from you today, and has given to one of your neighbors to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind. For he is not a man that he should not change his mind. As we look at this passage here, we start to see the downfall of Saul. And you know, even in this, we see his pride setting up a monument to himself. Why not set up a monument to the Lord who gave you the victory? Why not be obedient to the Lord? Saul got to the point in his life that he thought that as king, he no longer really had to obey the word of the Lord. And he went from more, this rebellion to more. This happens to us. Saul was removed as king because of his pride. And if our pride gets away, God can take us out of our position. You see, no matter who we are, we too can fall. And this is a warning for us. This has happened to a lot of men who have been in great ministries, big ministries of the Lord. We see this time and time again of people who, who are running big ministries, whether it would be big Bible colleges, whether it would be big organizations, great Christians, and they start off and then the pride and the arrogance set in. And we see a national fall. It should always be a reminder to us that no matter who we are, we can fall to pride. Satan not only lost his place, but he has a punishment waiting for him. Again, turn to Matthew chapter 25. This is another one of those passages where if you read it too fast, you miss out on the key statement here. Matthew 25, starting with verse 41. Matthew chapter 25, starting with verse 41. Then he will say to those of his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. This is a parable Jesus tells about the sheep and the goats, but in its context, and this is what most people focus on. And we see that the sheep get to go to heaven and the goats are going to hell. We see why. But what is off the list of this passage? This little line there, because we read way too fast sometimes and are not really paying attention. It's the fact that Jesus said that hell was prepared for Satan and his angels. See, hell is not Satan's playground. It's his punishment. Theology from TV 
in literature has often ruined us. And too often we see Satan down in hell having this good old time tormenting and torturing everyone. What we have to understand is that hell in itself is actually a punishment for Satan. When you go back into the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is very important for it tells us about our victory, where we go, and where those who follow, where Satan and his followers go. And so when we go into Revelation chapter 20, verse 7 through 10, we see this. I will give you a key about understanding Revelation. Quit trying to figure out the stuff you cannot understand and start reading and understanding what is very clear. This is a very clear passage here, which means we have no excuse for not reading it and understanding it. So if you want to understand Revelation, quit trying to figure everything out and look for the things that have the, the essential and basic understandings that anybody can understand. This is an example. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Gog, to gather them for battle. In number they are like the sand on the seashore. They march across the breadth of the earth and surround the camp of God's people, the city he loves. The fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Instead of trying to figure out what the thousand years mean, instead of trying to figure out what Gog and Magog means, won't you see the clear teaching here? Sometimes, I've always wondered why Revelation is written the way that it is. Maybe it's sometimes for people who really want to know what God's will is that you will buckle down and look for passages like this. Instead of trying to figure out everything else. So this is a key passage right here. What we see in this key key passage is this. Satan is going to be thrown into hell where he will be tormented day and night. He's not going to like it down there. It's not his place of pleasure. It's his place of torment. But Satan is going to hell because of his rebellion. He led a rebellion in heaven. He came to earth and led a rebellion. And rebellion against God means that you have a home in hell. Not just for Satan, by the way. If we join Satan in his rebellion, we will join him in his punishment. While it may seem like you get away with more stuff here on earth if you side with Satan, the truth of the matter is, you will lose it all in hell. Once again, this is a passage we should be able to clearly understand its purpose here. Here's its purpose. Listen. Start with Revelation again, chapter 20, start with verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne in him who was seated on it. Earth and sky had fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the book. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he has done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. The demon's name was not found written in the book of life. He was thrown into the lake of fire. A lot of things we maybe cannot understand about Revelation, but here's a clear one. There's going to be a judgment day. There's a book of life. If your name is not in the book of life, that means you joined in Satan's rebellion. If your name is in the book of life, that's because you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior by repenting of your sins, confessing him as your Lord and Savior, believing with all your heart in the biblical testimony about him, and being baptized for forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit, and being faithful to him to death. Otherwise, punishment is the eternal lake of burning sulfur. If you join in Satan's rebellion, you join in his punishment. Engaging in, engaging in sin is participating in Satan's rebellion. So will we follow God? Or will we follow Satan? So what's Satan's attitude? In the book of Revelation, when we were looking at it, we saw a specific attitude that Peter talks about in 1 Peter chapter 5, starting with verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 5, starting with verse 8. 
Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. <clears throat> the idea here that Peter's putting this the same one we read in Revelation at the beginning of the passage where we talked about the enormous red dragon. Though Satan is defeated, he has not quit. Though Satan is defeated, he has not quit. He continues in his rebellion to this day. And Jesus views the church as his body and his, and his bride. In other words, he has a personal relationship with the church, and whatever happens to the church, it takes personal to him. We see in Colossians chapter 1, starting with verse 18, this attitude that he has about the church. First Corinthians, or excuse me, Colossians chapter 1, starting with verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the first fruit, or firstborn from among the dead, so that in him, so that in everything he might have supremacy. Notice this, he is the head of the body of the church. What happens to the church? Christ takes personal. So in his anger, Satan attacks the church. In other words, Satan knows he cannot directly attack God and win. So he does something else instead. He goes and he attacks the church. He tries to turn the church against God. He tries to hurt and harm the church so that others will not join it. Satan's goal now is to attack the church and do as much damage as possible before his day of judgment arrives. And I want to tell you this. Our attitude about the church is a reflection of who we follow. I grow tired and weary of people proclaiming a lie from Satan and proclaiming that they can love Christ, but they don't love his church. There, I, I challenge you. I, I seriously do. I challenge you to find that anywhere in Scripture. Because in Scripture, Jesus says he loves his church. The church is called his body and his bride. If you don't like the church, you're cut off from the head. Your attitude about the church is a direct reflection of who you really follow. If you, if those who follow Jesus loves his church. Look, I'm not saying the church is perfect. I'm not saying we don't get upset with some of the things the church does on occasions. All of us do. The church isn't perfect. It isn't perfect because you and I are not perfect. But to say that you hate the church is an unbiblical statement that Jesus does not support because Jesus loves his church. And if we are followers of Jesus, we love what Jesus loves. So those who follow Satan actually hates Christ's church. I hate to break that to you. If your person says, I don't love the church, that is Satan's attitude. Satan hates the church. They may not even know and understand why they hate it. They just hate it. And some of the people who follow Satan the most do not, do not have a clue that they are. Satan has rebelled against God when he sinned. And behind that rebellion was his pride or conceit note that caused him to go into that sin. So as a result of his rebellion, he lost his place in heaven, and he also has a future punishment that he knows is coming. And he knows more than we do how bad it's going to be. Because he's lost, because he's going to face punishment, he is angry. And that anger is turned against the church, and he desires to hurt the church. So what does this mean for us? Well, look, we may, while we do not know exactly how Satan fell, God does not go detail into detail about the fall of Satan. He does know it about the fall of man, but not the fall of Satan. We do know about our own rebellion. We know about our own sin. We know about our own disobedience. Satan can't do anything more about his rebellion. He's lost. He's gone. We, however, do have an opportunity. We can learn from our sins. We can repent of our sins. We can follow Jesus Christ. I told you, those who follow Satan's rebellion face Satan's fate. You can be saved from Satan's fate. You don't have to face it. 
You just got to swallow your pride enough to admit that there is a God in heaven. You have to swallow your pride enough to admit you cannot save yourself, that it is only the blood of Jesus Christ that can save you from your sins. You have to swallow the pride enough to bend your knee and confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, because you believe with it in all your heart. You must swallow your pride enough to admit, I am a sinner, and I will repent of my sins. That is, turn away from my sins. Turn away from what I desire. Turn towards God. We have to humble our knee enough to accept baptism for the forgiveness of our sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have to swallow our pride enough to follow Jesus the rest of our days. You do that. God has made a promise to save you. Do you trust in God's promises enough to be saved from Satan's <coughs> if you do, we encourage you to come forward as we stand and sing your traditional song.